You're listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma. I'm your host, Trish Close. The incredibly kind and funny Ian Birch on the podcast today. He's the winemaker at Archery Summit in the Willamette Valley. Ian talks about how the seed of viticulture was planted in his brain at a very early age, junior in high school to be exact, and his path to become a winemaker has been very steady, driven, and focused ever since. He's worked at wineries from California to South Africa, and he ultimately lands the job as winemaker at Archery Summit. We talk about the magic of the Willamette Valley. He explains why he thinks the property and the facility at Archery Summit is so very special. There may be a ghost story in there somewhere. And really, this interview was confession time. Here's Ian Birch. I was full on (laughs) Kathleen Turner last night. Oh, no. Yeah. You're you're, you're a champion. You know when you get get sick and then your voice like drops in your chest and then all of a sudden it's like, I've been drinking whiskey and smoking cigars my entire life. So I was like, I'm like, Hey honey, are you ready to go to bed? I mean, that's literally, it was so, my voice was so deep last night. He's like, should I call? Oh, I don't need to call the cops. I didn't know who that was. Um, Okay. Well, hi Ian Birch. We're recording. Thanks for being here today. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me Monday morning. It's like, yeah, I know I'm all ready for the week. Here we go. Here we go. Um, for those of um, for those who don't know you, Ian Birch, you're the winemaker at Archery Summit. You've been there how long now? It's been four years. It's just right right at that four year mark right now. I mean, and I'm always amazed. It goes so fast. Yeah, and I mean, four years. I don't want to say that's that's like new. That's kind of new. Like four years. That's not. I mean, that's not a big chunk of time. Yeah, I mean, when you have one chance a year to like make your mark Uh, you know i've i've had what four chances and every single year it's like oh man i should have done that differently (laughs) or you know like oh i'm gonna do that next time you know there's always like this sort of odd learning curve and um we are in the mindset that we still haven't made our best bottle of wine like it it still exists so That's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, there are certain vintages I like more than others. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you that every vintage is the best um, because I don't, I don't work that way, but yeah, it, it just feels like the time has gone so fast. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's the beauty about your job. I mean, every job really, you can wake up tomorrow and do it better than you did today. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we, we have a motto in, um, production it's like make a plan to break it you know like we always are kind of moving forward but you know one wine sells out faster than another or mother nature like kicks you in the gut and you have to readjust every day yeah and i i think you know this industry i don't know if there's many other industries like it i think about it just like how many industries do you literally have to change direction like whether you like to or not, um, just depending on like what's happening outside. No kidding. Oh my gosh. No kidding. We're going to talk a lot about wine and winemaking and how you got into this field specifically. Uh, where'd you grow up Ian Birch? So I grew up in Roseville, um, near Sacramento, home of the auto mall. Um, (laughs) I think there's like sun splashes out there too. Uh, we had some pretty cool malls. Uh, growing up uh, that we used to walk around, you know, Malls. sort of suburbia, um, uh-huh. you know, like my dad actually uh, sold agricultural chemicals and he had kind of moved across the country. We were in Pennsylvania uh, just before we moved to Roseville in 1986. Mm-hmm. And uh, my poor mother had to move um, five children across the country um and yeah like Whoa. i guess you can say yeah it, it was a it's kind of a kind of a crazy crazy exodus for us but i've i've actually grown up in agriculture um my dad used to talk about like being in cotton fields when he was young and um when he was going through college like counting insects on uh cotton to figure out 
how how much chemical they would need or if they didn't need any chemical. But I quickly learned what a pre-emergent and fungicide and what 2,4-D and glyphosate did nice. to various nice. plants in our backyard. You were yeah. you were the kid on the playground. You're like, hey, everybody, come gather around. Let me show you what's on this plant right now. <laughs> See that weed over there? That's a, that's a monocot. Uh, <laughs> and um, so glyphosate kills everything. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the good side of all this, though, was that I was like, oh, man, I can grow stuff. And we had a huge backyard. And there's this area on the very bottom of our property, which I believe used to be an old um, cattle operation. So they, they used to have, um, you know, cattle herds kind of chewing down the grass. And it was just kind of a large area that um, they just sort of developed that was, you know, former prairie land. Um, lots of like Maidu Indians and uh, it's just kind of a cool area culturally. But my dad would... Uh, order a bunch of topsoil and have it dumped on the bottom of the property there. And he helped me like put an irrigation line. Wow. So I got to kind of figure out how plants worked and fertilizers and, um, you know, spraying chemicals, which was never my favorite. Right. I hated spraying chemicals. But you really, um, you really had an introduction to, I mean, agriculture at a super young age. Totally. It was fun. I mean, I used to just bop around the yard and capture um like grasshoppers and I, oddly it's like it's not dark i'm not a dark guy but i used to like be crazy into black widows when i was a kid Whoa. just like yeah i used to throw grasshoppers into their webs and like wait till they came out and like catch them in a jar and be like hey mom dad and i think they probably were horrified yeah but i'm like hey, i got this like this nine-year-old kid don't worry about it uh. um I don't know. I just, I feel like I, I, I liked being outside, you know, like just making like huts out of sticks and straw and just like laying in them, just chilling out. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. So what I think I've entertained myself a lot outside. Oh yeah. I was like, I was like a bug, like oh. plant nerd. Okay. <laughs> so that, that reminds me of a story. I, I want to say it was like seventh grade, maybe eighth grade science project. We had to collect about, I want to say 20 different insects and pin them on a board oh. and put their like scientific name underneath them and then like details about them. Yeah. Looking back now, who, what teacher thinks that 30 students are going to be able to hunt down 20 different kinds of insects, kill them so they're still like pristine and then pin yeah. them on a board? What? That's a lot. I mean, for a kid, I did that in college. And I was like, exactly. oh, wait, how do you kill those bugs? Right. Like, mm, that's kind of, uh, ooh, yeah, that, that's, that's a little horrifying. I'm out I don't there know. like formaldehyde, sounds... like in a jar with cotton balls. Like... <laughs> it's like, it's, I think it's dead. Where's the pin, mom? I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. crazy. It is crazy. Yeah, I don't, I can't picture my kids doing that. No I think it's like, I'm like, don't step on the ant. Thank you. Like, yeah. yeah. It's fun. Like the ant is, is your friend. The spider. Yeah. The spider eats uh, other bugs. Like don't kill the spiders. No, I'm with you there. They're okay. I'm but if they're you. crawling on you in your sleep, that's no, another thing. Oh, no, <laughs> no, they're sorry, buddy. You're a goner. You're a goner <laughs> at that point. Um, where were you in the, li or where are you in the lineup of, of five kids? I'm number five. So I've got, um, you know, four sisters and a brother and my little sister, Mo, who is awesome. She always tried to be as cool as me and it, it never really happened. But, um, you know, she, I think she's still trying, but, uh, I have to give her, I have to give her something, you know? Nice. So go, number go five, Mo. wait, so number <laughs> five, you, you're like at the bottom then. I'm kind of at the bottom with like a really cool younger sister, okay. actually, who is who is cooler than me. Um, I hope she watches this and laughs. Hey, Mo. Um, hey, Mo. She's she's the best. I, I love my whole family. They they're all done something different in life. And yeah, I think pretty, pretty fun group of people to grow up with. Mm -hmm. But I definitely put on the the ag hat and nobody else did. So it's like kind of like my territory in a weird way. Yeah. 
but they all love drinking wine. So they well, get to hear me nerd out a lot. Awesome. Well, I know you went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Now, did you go to Cal Poly because that was the best school for what you wanted to get into? Or did you go to Cal Poly because it's in San Luis Obispo? I went to Cal Poly because it was in San Luis Obispo. Yeah. And it wasn't Davis. <laughs> That's essentially it. <laughs> so did you, is that what you were going for? You were going into agriculture? You were going into winemaking? What What did you want to do? So my junior year of high school, I had a teacher uh, main, named Mr. Jin. Uh, ironically, uh, it's funny. Um, he was talking about uh, viticulture and I was like, wait, like, he's like, yeah, science of growing grapes. I was like, wait, hold on. So like, you can study that. And he's like, yeah, people go to college for it. It's like, I know what I want to do. Like, wow. I, I, if I, I could grow grapes, you know, it's like went to Catholic school, like drinking wine at communion, you know, like just Zeus and the land of eternal sunsets and just laying around in your underwear and drinking wine. It's like, oh my gosh, like wine's amazing. Like I'm going to, I'm going to make wine. And I went to Cal Poly because they, you know, fairly close to the ocean. Uh Um, I had to take three more physics classes to go to Davis. And I was like, I am not, I'm no, I'm not doing it. No. So I went to Cal Poly. I was told to sign up as a fruit science major, which I did. And that was kind of fun telling my friends, they're like, what are you going to college for? I'm like, fruit science. What What is that? And then. I was like, oh, but after a year, I started, um, I switched to wine and vit and my, my emphasis was viticulture because the enology program was really sort of young and developing and the founders of the university uh, made it a dry campus. So studying wine and not being able to consume it was like, hmm, how do we do this? So we uh, figured out a way to like set up these tastings off campus, like off the contiguous campus. And actually one of my buddies, uh, Brian Seamus, um, is in wine law now that I graduated with. And he he kind of took a um, part of his dad's practice and practices wine law down there and helped to kind of cut through a lot of red tape. And now Cal Poly has a winemaking facility and they're like on their A game. Wow. Which is really cool. Go Brian. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. He's a great guy. Well, I mean, that you bring up a good point. How how do you know that's like one third of what you're studying, right? Right. Half? Yeah. Oh. In terms of like viticulture? Right. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, it's a really good point. I, I, my, my professor at the time was also my advisor, Keith Patterson. He was a wonderful guy. He's passed away. Um, but he was like such a good person to have around. And he used to always say, he's like, Hey, you're only new to college once. Don't, don't be in a rush to get out. He's like, really soak it all in. And, you know, I, I felt very good about my vineyard knowledge, you know, soil science, fertilizer science, plant physiology, grapevine physiology, you know, like all of these little building blocks to kind of make me what I, what I was in, what I am today. And in terms of winemaking, it's like, hey, grab that five gallon bucket over there and smush up some grapes and then come and like read the bricks in the morning is like, oh, that's it. You know, like we would go through chemistry, but the practical winemaking side was just not really good um, and not enough for me. And I think I slowly over the course of like many internships realized that when you were making wine, you have like a different control over the vineyard like when you're in the vineyard you control the vineyard but it's always like it's like what are they gonna do with this fruit you know are they gonna screw it up or are they gonna add something strange to it and make it taste different and i felt like as a winemaker you could kind of guide the people in the vineyard to like do things the way you like them so that you know, you have like these little teeny clusters that come in as opposed to large clusters or they undercrop an area and overcrop another. So I think even early on, I I wanted to kind of go more of that winemaking route. So before my last quarter at Cal Poly, 
I, um, I, I interned at Gallo in their experimental research facility. And this is already after I had um, interned in Australia at Penfolds. Like I got accepted to Cal Poly when I was at Penfolds. Um, and that was like really pumped about that to had like some, like a mission when I got back home. For sure. But I was like weighing fruit and running basic analysis. And I was like, I still need to figure out this winemaking thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, when I, I worked at Gallo, um, oh, I got, I got a student loan. And I doubt anybody from the government is listening, but I invested some of my student loan into Starbucks stock because I was working at Starbucks at the time. And it was like going up and splitting. It was like, this is incredible. And then at Gallo, minus like the, hey, I'm learning a lot about viticulture stuff. The winemaker quit the first day of harvest. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, young guy, you want to wake, you want to make wine at night? And work in the vineyards all day and it's like uh yeah i'm your guy so i was getting like time and a half and double time nice and i paid off 85 percent of my student loan in that one internship Fantastic. because like gallo gallo loves their employees they like they give you a house and they give you kisses every day like they are so good to their people <laughs> but it was cool it was a very cool place to work like i I made um, two ton lots of Cabernet and Merlot off of three different sites. And each one was a different experiment. Mm. Crop load, there was different um, fertilizer experiments. And Gallo is the largest independently funded experimental uh, research um, agency on, on the planet Earth. Wow. So I was like with a a staff of, I think I was like with Mary in the vineyard. I was with one other person on the ground and there was maybe two other people in the office and a massive organization like Gallo. Wow. So it was, yeah. it was super cool. It sounds like from a very early age though, you knew this is at least the industry you wanted to be in because for a lot of winemakers, if they even went to school, maybe they studied psychology and they had a whole different career and then got into winemaking somewhere down the road. I mean, this was junior in high school. You're like, yep, this is what I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Let's do it. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, I was, it's just those little formative moments. I remember there's this very sweet woman I worked with at Starbucks. And I remember like, like taking the mats off the floor and like mopping and, just going really like really fast and like just working hard and because it's my first job right. and she's like you know what kid if you keep working like that you can do anything and she wasn't my boss or anything and I was like you know what this is really sweet of her to say you know and I've always kind of like taken that day and like that sort of I don't know it's like the, my love language I love like when people like say, Oh, good job. It's like, it really motivates me, uh -huh. you know? And I feel like, like from that point onwards, I figured, you know, you got to do whatever you do really well. And you have to pretend that people are watching you and that whoever's watching you is going to tell who you want to work for, how you worked. Yeah. You know, like it's kind of work. Like somebody's always watching and work hard and um, you know, I like drinking wine too. Right. So, uh, yeah, That's I just, some good this advice, though. that's some really good advice. Yeah. Work like someone's always watching you because you're right. You never know the encounter that you're going to have with someone. They're going to see how hard you're working in that day. And then they're going to go, I want, I think I want you to work at my company. You don't know. That's right. Hmm, that's right. Good advice. It's yeah. Thanks. I, it's, it's done me well, I think. Um, and not try not to be an asshole. <laughs> Just try to be kind. You could never, like, I don't think you could ever be an asshole, Ian Birch. I don't think it's in you. I like, I hope not. Um, I hope that I don't come across that way. I think, I think sometimes I'm very direct, but, um, you know, I just feel like there are so many people that have moved ahead by being mean. And, you know, I think some of the people I admire the most are successful people that are kind. Mm -hmm. They're the best. Yeah. I agree. My motto, yeah. one of my, one of my mottos in life is don't be a dick. 
Just don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's like, just don't do it. Like, yeah. come on. You can choose. Like I always tell my kids, like, you can choose to be nice. You know, yeah. you can choose to be mean. Like, yeah. just choose not to be a dick. Every, every time. Every I don't do that to them, though. I do want to I do want to just a side note. You and I have known each other for a couple of years now, a few years I would say. Oh, yeah. yeah. We met through Oregon Wine Experience Grape to Glass. We were up in the Willamette shooting a segment. And I mean, I just have to say being at Archery Summit, I think when you when you drive up to Archery Summit, it's it's grand, it's grandiose, it's a little intimidating. The wines are like, wow, everything is so pristine and beautiful and big and clean and gorgeous. And I'm like, this this winery is going to be a bunch of snobs. I can tell. (laughs) And like you guys were the furthest thing from that. Like the nicest, sweetest, most genuine, hardworking people I have met ever. So I just want to say you and I have, we we met a while ago and, and we've sort of somewhat here and there kind of stayed in touch. And, um, but for those who are listening, we, we, we do know, we do know each other. This isn't like the first time I'm ever meeting or talking to you. (laughs) <laughs> thank you for saying that i think it says a lot about our leadership mm-hmm. um it's funny our uh ceo when it when she first kind of spoke in front of the whole group said she has a no asshole policy she promotes a healthy workspace like physically and mentally perfect and my boss uh nicholas he's also like a very kind person but also extremely talented um like on the spectrum, like, oh my gosh, uh-huh. this guy, like, oh, it's just so much fun to, to talk to and learn from. But I, I think that they're really good at sort of weeding out um, the the bad good. and bringing the good. And it, I think that it sort of becomes a part of everybody um, from the top down. Well, you can tell even the last time I was there, um, the servers that were in the cave, I mean, just, just the positivity from everybody who works at Archery Summit, you can really feel it. So they're doing Great. Thanks they're for doing that. something right. So you're definitely going into this industry, but are you are you sold on being a winemaker? Is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, it's funny as you intern, I think not only do you get to go to other beautiful places in the world and meet families and see how people like cook dinner and you know, what they talk about and, you know, what their struggles are, but you also get to figure out like what size operation you want to work for or what varieties you'd like to work with. Right. And, you know, I think I slowly realized that being with a smaller outfit, you know, like 10, 15,000 cases where you're making decisions for the vineyard and the winery, um, you know, it's kind of the place where I'd like to be. Um, I love Oregon. I think Oregon's always been on my radar as uh, somewhere to go. Like my professor used to always talk about how Oregon was always sort of on the perimeter. And it was in that sort of like that fuzzy place, just off center from exactly what you what you need in a place in terms of water, um, climate, growing degree days, warmth. Um, and I've slowly sort of realized that, you know, the industry is moving up North as the planet gets hotter. Right. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, you can, you can actually make a lot more in Oregon than you can in Europe. Cause I, I really considered working in France because, uh, I, I had an opportunity to work out there, uh, a handful of times, but as much as I love the lifestyle out there, the pay is not very good. Huh. So, you know, I just think like finding all these little things that lined up kind of led me here. And yeah, I plan to be a winemaker. You know, I keep saying for the next 10 years, you know, like at our tree summit, I'm like 10 years. That's, I can definitely do that. And now I'm like, ah, 10 more years. Uh, let's do 10 nice, more years. Nice. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. I love that's Oregon in a nutshell. We're just off center. <laughs> Yeah. That's and us. that's crazy because there is like, there's so many years where it's just cool, too cool right. and rainy in like the early nineties. And then we, with global warming, of course, you have these like crazy shifts yeah. where sometimes you get it just right. And sometimes it's, you know, it, it's not right. It's too hot or it's too cold. But I think that all of these trends show 
that like Oregon is moving or especially the Willamette, uh, Southern Oregon, of course. Yeah. But I, I study the Willamette a lot. And I think that like we're positioned to be in a really good spot. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm putting my chips on the Willamette Valley for a while. Beautiful. Well, and it's interesting too, that you knew that you wanted to work maybe somewhere smaller because at Gallo, I mean, that's kind of like at that time, that was probably like the mothership, right? Oh yeah. It was like, it was huge. I mean, it was really cool to see how people uh, were organized there. They hire a lot of people that are um, ex-military uh, just so that they can sort of like be more like, all right, you go there, you go there. Like okay. there's like a chain of command and um, they're very organized in that regard. Okay. But I mean, after I studied at Cal, Cal Poly, I, uh, I got an internship in the Loire Mm-hmm. at a place called Domingo Joe Piton or P-I-T-H-O-N. So they're, um, they're over in the Loire Valley, Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Franc, right. um, wonderful sites. And I, like, I went through this agency called S- Sesame and they deal with agricultural um, exchanges. And I forged my application because they required that you had like a French class under your belt. Uh So I filled in my unofficial transcript at Cal Poly and printed it. And then I deleted it because I couldn't take that class because I I had one more requirement that overlapped with the same time. So like I I taught myself how to speak French my last quarter of Cal Poly. And I always remember this flying into Charles de Gaulle and the lady's like, you know, like you are screwed because you don't know how to <laughs> speak French. It's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? But all of your secrets I, are coming out in this podcast. I interview. know, like all ooh. of them. Oh, it's like, oh, it and was like, crazy. But the, I like how your voice drops too when you're like, I forged. I, sh- <laughs> I don't want my kids to hear me. <laughs> but you survived. You made it. You did fine. Oh, it was great. It, again, it's like I wasn't like the the kid in the corner that couldn't speak French and was lazy. Like, ugh, those are the worst people. I was like the guy that couldn't speak French that like was like, all right, let's go. Working your you know, ass like, off. All the time. Totally. Yeah. And like wrote, took notes and like wrote down a, like a couple words every day and put them in my book. And, you know, by the end of it, I still sounded like a caveman, but like, uh, you know, I had made some of like, I, I still keep in touch with every single person I worked with Aww. in the Loire during that internship. It was absolutely lovely. Well, I read that in, while you were in Loire, you really fell in love with Pinot, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay specifically. Yeah. What was it about those two grapes that you were just like, oh, this is it? Well, we would taste wines um, blind or blindly every day after work. My boss would like tiptoe and do the cellar and like open up bottles and pour them into like a craft. And uh, we would get like a bunch of these little teeny wine glasses off the sink that like had lip marks on them. And like, they're just like stinky and gross. And we just do a little like yep. water rinse. And we would, we would try, try the wines like blindly. And for me, they would do variety and vintage. And in France, you know, just depending on the region, like the region usually um, insinuates like what was what's grown there. So they would say like Kel Kel uh, Cepage. It's like what vintage, like Kel Milzim, you know. And they would play that with me, and then they would go into like the French banter about like where it was from and how it was atypical or just right or whatever. And my palate grew so fast um, during that time period. And I really had time to like dissect it and connect. It was almost like a different form of language with them because like I couldn't speak French very well. But over the the course of being there, I was there for about six months. Um, They took me to Burgundy and, you know, I was like the intern that got to go. Some of the other people that I work with are like, you can't believe you get to go Nice because like, yeah, like you are going to go to the most ridiculous places. Like we went to like Romana Conti and like Rouleau. Uh, we went to a Comte Lafon, Dominique Lafon, who um, ironically I ended up working with in Oregon because he was a consultant winemaker at Evening Land. I took notes. So like 
when I applied for the evening land job years later, I was like, oh, I tasted with that guy. He smoked cigarettes in a cellar and his wines were phenomenal. You know, like wow. I remember him, but I just was like, my brain was spinning. There was, you know, working in this small organic operation in the Loire, making Chenin Blanc and Cab Franc and, you know, rounding it out with these like Burgundian wines that were just incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I'd, I'd tasted like Pinot Noir from Santa Barbara and Edna Valley just because it was so close to Cal Poly. But, you know, there was this magic to the wines. And even in the Loire, like these families have been making wine for so long. It, it was just like in their DNA, right? you know, like it just was their life. And in America, everybody's very analytical and rightly so. It, it's sort of a new industry mm-hmm. and people want to get it right and they want to do the right things. But I, I feel like there was so much that was just sort of given in Europe. There's so much that was like not discussed that I feel like we discuss very often um, in, a, in the States. And it just, it felt good to like start there and just have all of these like wine principles and practices sort of just be like there, like for me to take in and observe and uh, not necessarily have to like scrutinize over. For sure. It was, it was super, super cool. Well, Dominique Lafon eventually became your mentor when you worked. Yes. Yeah. When you worked with him, right? That's right. So and he smoked, I was in. He smoked in the cellar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that and like that's I mean, supposed to like kill your taste buds, right? Well, so that's the thing. If you so it's like imbibition, even if you smoke, like you still can taste if you smoke regularly. It's if you smoke and then you don't smoke, they say that's when it really kind of screws up your palate. Oh. Um it, when you quit, it takes a while for you to kind of get um your palate back. Um but, you know, he he was like the king of texture and he would just nail it. Like when he consulted with us, even in Oregon, we would go through, you know, 50 different wines and he would taste the wines like very objectively. And I, I related with every single comment he made, you know, whether the wine was like uh, really delicious or if it was struggling and nine times out of 10, it's like, Oh yeah, that, that wine got stuck during fermentation and it's gross. Like, yes. You know, like, yeah, it was, it was, it was so very was enlightening right to uh, every time. Hmm. Yeah. He was, I think Dominique's my takeaway from Dominique. My biggest takeaway from him is, you know, like if something is wrong with your wine, don't wait for it to get better. Fix it right then. Like, if you have something that's strange, like if the wine's getting stinky and it needs air and you need to pull out that pump and rinse it out mm. and attach it to the tank and it's midnight and you need to spend an hour uh, just farting around, like that's what you got to do. Do it. Because do it. if you wait, there's a chance that that stink may stick into the wine. And if something else happens that is more important, then you're not going to be able to go back and fix it. Interesting. So, yeah, I've always been a big believer in that. Um, I, I don't like to wait. Um, and it sometimes gets me in trouble, but most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> but I like to, you know, if you see something that can be problematic, jump up. It's like, I have nothing else to do right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of this. Yeah. And you can usually yeah. feel that in your gut, right? You kind of go, oh yeah, go back and forth a little bit. You're like, should should I? No, uh, yeah, I got to do something right now. Yeah, right, right. And then you've got people like my boss is extremely objective as well. So if I, yeah, you know, I'm always worried that I can talk myself into something. I mean, I, I try to be cognizant um, of like everything around me, but you know, he's so, such a good soundboard. Like tricky vintages, rain fires right you know it's like all right this is what i'm thinking and he's like yeah i think you i think you got it it's like all right you know just that that little bit of confidence that uh goes a long way so 
let's get back to you. You were saying you were looking at Oregon. It had always kind of been on your radar as somewhere you wanted yeah. to work. Um, why the Willamette Valley specifically? Because of the Pinot Pinot Noir Chardonnay, it could it could be grown well there. Like, what was the connection for you? That was pretty much. I mean, for me, it was simple originally. It was like more water in Oregon, less water in California. Right. And it's like hotter California, warmer Oregon. Great. And then you know, I I had tasted very few Oregon wines before I actually moved to Oregon. And I just knew when I saw the evening land vineyards posting on winebusiness.com or what it's like wine jobs. That's where I've gotten almost every job I've, I have right now. No way. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful, like winejobs.com. It's sweet. Um, we should I just, I, cue the advertisement for winejobs.com right now. <laughs> winejobs.com. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I just, you know, I saw the opportunity. I was actually, I was working in South Africa. I was making like $20 a day, uh, having a good time. But I was like, you know, this interning thing is cool, but I think I'm ready for the next step. And I wanted to work in one place that I could learn from seasonally, from vintage to vintage, instead of making a wine and leaving. Totally. And when I saw the ad uh, for Evening Land, like I had, um, I had taken a position, another dirty secret. Oh. Uh, I had taken the position as intern at Penner Ash. Oh, and Sorry, I felt Penner so bad. Ash. Sorry, guys. I know, because it was like assistant winemaker, like, or intern. It's like, oh, and I, I always feel so bad. I don't know if they know that, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I had just. I'm, I'm coming clean. I feel like I'm, this is like confession. Trish confession. Yeah. Let's call this like confessional, con, con, conf, like wine confessions. It wasn't meant, it um, wasn't meant to be for you to be at Penner Ash. Let's just, let's just say that. Although so. I like their wines, you know, and yeah. I, I like, yeah, they're wonderful individuals. Um, but yeah, I, I saw, I saw Dominique Lafon. I was like, I know that name. And then Seven Springs, and it was like Seven Springs. Let me Google that. And it's like, oh damn, they sell to a lot of incredible people. And then you know, French people. My boss was uh, she was from Canada. She's Quebecois. It's like not the real French, you know, but that's fine. Right. Um, and I'm just, and uh, we, yeah, we ended up like working really well together. And for a long time, I think we, gosh, I was there almost eight years. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I just, I think I got lucky, you know, like all the little things I wanted were there, but I don't, I, I, I would have to say that I got very lucky to like jump into the Willamette. Um, yeah. I would have loved to say like, Oh, I did tons of competitive tastings and the Willamette was always my number one and clearly the best place on the planet to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Right. But, uh, you know, I had a hunch and the wines I had tried fit. So um, I feel I feel extremely lucky to have landed there. Well, it was just it was just along your path. I mean, and in all seriousness, like, you know, you could say the job at Penner Ash could have led, led you somewhere else. And I mean, who's to say that when you didn't take that job, they hired someone that fit there better. So, like, I think everything totally. happens for a reason. I, I, I think I need you to be there with me if I ever come clean with them. I'll be the mediator. Just to like, all right, Trish. I'll be go. like, listen, guys, it just wasn't in the cards for either one of you. <laughs> and and like, I dug back and looked at who did work with you back then. And look where they are now. Uh, look at the contributions. Look at the contributions they have made. So from from that job, then, did you go straight to Archery Summit after that? After those years working? So- I worked so at Evening Land. I I got to work in Burgundy two harvests. Uh -huh. So I, I got I worked uh, with Dominic Lafon. Like he had his domain Dominic Lafon label that he was emerging. Um, we shared a facility with him. So I I got to work with him there. Um, see how he made his wine in Merceau, wow. and also in um, like Puy Fuisse, which is south of Burgundy. Like wonderful wines. Yeah treated the wines the same way he treated ours in Oregon. It's like so cool. And um, 
yeah, so I, I went there a couple times. And then Evening Land Cote d'Or, our sister winery, who was a negotiant, needed a winemaker. So they, they asked me to move to, uh, to France with my wife and live in a chateau uh, outside of Burgundy. It was like, oh, what? That sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Um, <laughs> Sign me up. So we, we packed up our cat. Uh, got it all the right shots and sold my little Honda, my blue Honda. Cool. My wife quit her job, which she had, hadn't been working at very long because she and I actually met at Evening Land in 2011. Um, she interned for us and, you know, she was just like such a, like a classy lady. Um, beautiful. But I never really like thought, yeah, I like, I realized I was in love with her when I had to like fire her um, because... <laughs> It was like, your internship's over. Like, do you want to get sushi? Um, nice. <laughs> Brilliant. So we we upplanted our life, moved to Burgundy. And while I was there um, eating foie gras and drinking incredible wines with my wonderful boss, uh, Christophe Fial, they had let go the winemaker at Evening Land and asked me to come back and, and make wine in Oregon as like winemaker. Wow. And yeah, I was like, man, this is too good to pass up. I feel like the Cote d'Or operation, the negotiation operation was like a little sort of misran and that it wouldn't necessarily be continuing for much longer. Mm. So I think it was a good move to say goodbye after about a year in France and, and move back to Oregon. So then I, I live, I, I worked with Sashi, Mormon and Rajpar for about a year. Uh, so I did the 2014 vintage with them. We bottled up the 12s and 13s and that 12 that we bottled up that I had made because I wasn't there for 13, but the 12, we got a 98, 98 points from wine spectator for the Pinot Hot and deal. 97 for the Shard. Wow. Hoo-wee. Yeah. It was crazy. Was well, crazy. and the crazy part was, is that we had, so Isabel, like my, my boss there, had put the blends together and, you know, like had everything set this many labels, this many corks, bada bing, bada boom. And then she left and then we reblended the wines. So we were like, no, those four lots don't work together. I think we should do these four lots. Mm. And we put them all together. And I wonder if, you know, we would have gotten a different score if, the wines were put together differently. I mean, you could say that. Yeah. Interesting. It's crazy to think. Yeah. It's crazy to think. So, so I mean, make the track yeah. back to Oregon. Or- yeah. We go back to Oregon. Um, well, I'm sitting in the house right now that we moved back to, back to, back into. Um, we're in the Eol Amity Hills yep. on a vineyard called Sojo. Um, Dennis Pisso owns the vineyard and the house. And we, you know, like put work into it, like, we paint and we ripped out all the carpets and um, we ultimately uh, will buy this place someday. Um, we have the first right of refusal, which is great. Nice. It's unofficial, but he's just, he's such a kind guy. So he's going to, he's going to offer it to us first and we hope to buy it, but um, it's we've been now. living in this house. We just made it. What's official. that now? We just made it official. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> we're doing it. But we've been here since 2014 and when I got back, I worked with Sashi and Raj, and I just wanted to be on my own. So I, I got a job at Scott Paul Wines, which was this small outfit in Carlton, mm-hmm. owned by Cameron Healy, wonderful guy. Um, started Kettle Chips and Kona Brewing. No way. And awesome guy. Like, I, I love him. Kettle like, Chips. He, oh, my gosh. So, you know, he did well for himself. Um, but – he was also just the most genuinely kind individual that I've ever met in my life. Um, and maybe it's because he lives in Hawaii half the year um, and in Oregon the other half of the year. Right. Like he just was like so generous. And I soon realized after being there that they, um, they had split a negotiant away from Scott Paul. So they let Scott write, do his own thing in Portland 
with the champagne and with a lot of his burgundy wines. And then they rebranded the project in Oregon, hired um, this wonderful guy to uh, manage and another wonderful individual to market and me to make wine. And uh, I, I realized about after about a year that if it didn't succeed, they were going to close shop. Oh, no. So I was like, man. Yeah. And, you know, I think the wines were great and, I got to learn a lot about Dundee and um, Ribbon Ridge. And, um, you know, I think it just kind of got to the point where we were like kind of anticipating it close. Right. So, yeah, I um, I quickly started my own um, advising company, uh, consulting winemaking company, and started to kind of try to build two clients. And that's when I noticed uh, that there was a, a job opening for a winemaker at Archery Summit. And I had known the guy um, who would ultimately hire me. He had just got hired. His name is Nicholas Kier. And um, he was like a master of wine, double MBA, French. It's like, all right, like, I already like him. And I congratulated him. I said, hey, man, congratulations on your COO position. Um, you know, like, they got the right guy for it. Uh, I had worked with him intermittently at Scott Paul because he was friends with our marketing person and got to know his palate. You know, like I made some Riesling for him in our cellar for free as like an exchange so he can get his license to make wine in Oregon. And he was just super easy to work with, like just kind of a fun guy. And who knew that he ultimately would be, you know, responsible for giving me the job or not. Huh. Uh, it, it was crazy. So yeah, I, I texted him, congratulations. And then he accidentally texted me the next day. He was like, Hey man, uh, you're going to be at the soccer game tonight. And I was like, Hey, I, I think you got the wrong Ian. It's like, but I just, I noticed uh, you guys are hiring a winemaker at archery summit. And he's like, Hey, you'd be great for the job. Oh. And I was like, Oh, uh, what? And I talked to, I was very open with him. I was like, this is what's going on. And you know, this is my life. Like I have two clients. My wife wants me to own my own business. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little risky right now, whatever. And he was like mentor from the start and he talked me into it. Um, it didn't have to talk me into it much right. because he is wonderful to work with. And, um, it was also cool too, because at Scott Paul, my, uh, my boss, Cameron, he, uh, he gave me a hundred cases of wine of my choice to leave with What? because, and I, and I won't get into it too much. I didn't sign an NDA or anything, but you know, like I, I had a really kind exit from them yeah. because I stuck around and helped them with their assets and wine assets. Wow. And, uh, I asked Nicholas if archery summit would be interested in buying the hundred cases of wine and, you know, put like some fun label, like Ian's suitcase wine from, you know, whatever. And it was actually Marsh Vineyard that's right next to Arcus, which is one of our single vineyards at Archery Summit. Yep. And I used that same wine to interview with, with like my different interviewers. So like they all tasted, they're like, yeah, it's good. And uh, yeah, I just, it's kind of a funny a funny little entrance into archery summit. Um, so yeah, that transition was actually as, as difficult as it could have been. I right. think it was fairly warm and smooth and um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I made the transition. It's funny. You just said the word smooth because I was like, Ian, you're smooth. Like oh. that whole like work, like no one's watching you or like someone's watching you. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's just smooth, but that also, that's some good like professional advice, right? Like you, you, you make good connections and then you keep up with those connections. Right. And it's right. always positive. Right. I could be a lot better at it, but it, it's something I ca I'm cognizant of now more than ever. Like just pick up the phone randomly and call somebody, you know, yeah. and congratulate somebody yeah. that is doing something well, you know, smart. it always comes back always comes back. Um, really quickly, let's talk about Archery Summit because this was started by Gary Andrus. 
Is that right? That's right. Gary yep. Andrus, um, I believe in 1993. And what I read is that he saw this location and just basically went, he was head over heels in love with this, yeah. um, first of all, for Pinot Noir, but this location, right? Right. Yes, that's that's correct. I think when uh, the story story I've heard is that when he first looked at the property, there was a bunch of trailers parked on it. Oh. <laughs> and just like, like, oh, you know, this very like hillbilly. Uh -huh. And he had seen a lot of success in the same hills, you know, with the folks at Irie. Um, you know, he he knew just from looking at degree days and the latitude of the area, like it is the spot, really nice joy soil, um, all on a hill. And he, he had a lot of experience with, um, you know, winemaking and winery establishment in Napa because he had also established Pine Ridge Vineyards, which has a cave network underneath it. Um, there's a lot of like odd architectural things that we all laugh about sometimes like where just like lots of staircases and random doors and stuff that you know gary had masterminded but he rallied some really important investors and they saw his vision and drilled a quarter of a mile of tanks underneath our facility and made a 100 percent gravity fed winery where the grapes start at the top they turn into wine and then they go into barrel and go into bottle without a pump. And it was like the bee's knees back in the day. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, like this is spectacular. And somebody was putting a ton of money into the valley um, in a really loud way. And uh, it, I think it, attract, it attracted a, quite, a, quite a lot of attention. And um, currently we still follow a lot of the same model. We have five different estate vineyards in the Dundee Hills. Um, we like to pr predominantly make wine from the Dundee Hills off of our estates, but we have 65 acres that are currently uh, managed by, by us. And we have, you know, a number of different wines for our club uh, and also wines in wholesale distribution that we kind of get into the United States and abroad. But um, we've recently just gone to no spray um so we're not spraying any herbicides um we spray sulfur for powdery mildew that's about it right. and um we're, we're really trying to well we're actually going biodynamic so i'm like reintroducing microbes into the soil right. uh so that we can kind of like build it back and um hopefully go to no-till and start regenerating the soil and um you know we've got really good allies on the ground with results partners it's a management company and it's funny because the lady that manages results partners or rp uh her name is lee bartholomew and she was the vineyard manager at our tree summit for 14 years um back in the day four years before i got there wow so yeah i i brought her back on um and we work with evan strode on the ground who's like, you know, Midwest farming family, Love just it. like farmer dude, yeah. super attentive and organized. So I, I feel like um, we have a lot of really cool things going on production wise. And you talked about hospitality before, right? Karina uh, Gordon is in charge of running um, the state and all of the hospitality associated. And like, if we had good wine, I still feel like we would be really successful. I think if we had marginally okay wine, I think the experience is so strong that we would still be a strong brand. But because we have like awesome vineyard sites yeah. and people have trusted us for years and they can come in and have a really good time in the cave or like on the patio and they're talking to somebody intelligent that knows a lot about the wines and the brand. Right. It's a, it's a really enchanting experience it is it is i was that's a great word it is enchanting i mean just looking around at the vineyards and the facility and walking in the cave and you can feel it right like walking yeah. through walking through the cave all the barrels are, are lined against the walls i mean you can actually like there's some there's magic in there right it feels good it feels bigger than you you yeah. know yeah um 
and then when you work there, you never lose it. You, you always sort of, I, I have a very strong sense of appreciation for like what the brand is and was and like what it's going to be. You know, I, I always try to think of like what I want this brand to be when I leave. And, you know, especially for the land, like we got to leave the land better than it was. Totally. And, um, yeah, that's, that's huge. That's a huge thing for us. We're not putting it out in front of us, like biodynamic, like, you know, like hemp, ne- hemp necklaces and dreadlocks, you know, it's, it's more like just if you, if you don't spray the chemical, I always say this, if you don't spray a chemical on the vine, you won't consume it. Yeah. So whether or not like Monsanto can argue that, you know, glyphosate doesn't kill biological matter in the soil or that soil microbes break it up before it's uh, even possible for it to go into your system. It's like, how about we just don't talk about it at all Yeah, because we don't use it. There you go. And I, I do think um, there are a lot of negative things associated with it. Don't get me wrong, but it feels good that we can afford to, you know, not, um, not use chemicals. Yeah. And I'm hearing that a lot. Um, The more winemakers I meet, all around Oregon really is this idea of leaving the land better than how you found it. And that's huge because it's giving you so much, right? This is giving you job after job after job. So why wouldn't we take care of it? Yeah. Totally. And it's not just about the grapes. It's about the Oak stand that's next to us. And, you know, we, we put in, I think we're going to put in about two acres of wildflowers this year. We, we put tons of um, beneficial seeds onto fallow land so that we can hold on to soil, even though we're not farming grapes on it. You know, we, we try to make sure that we're taking care of everything in our operation that isn't just grapevines. And yeah, we're, we're slowly kind of getting into that, that mode of thinking where the things that are adjacent to the vineyard are just as important as the vineyard. Absolutely. And you've told me a few stories about um, the caves and how you have mm, some visitors sometimes from, oh, from beyond yeah. that, that come and visit you yeah. and, and pat you on the back and make sure you're doing your job right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm clairvoyant. Like, I don't think, I don't know. I mean, everybody, like, I was like, oh, I want to see a ghost, you know, like, I, that'd be cool. And it's like, then I say, oh, they, they're real. Like I saw one, but I feel like enough people have said things about hearing like high heels in the caves. And, you know, Corey, my associate has felt like somebody brush up against him. And it's always like late at night when you're by yourself Mm -hmm. and like, you know, the caves are crazy because they, they drip in certain spots and they're dark until the lights kind of flicker on. And, uh, you know, I, I've always been like waiting to like, you know, to have Gary, like, you know, give me a bear hug from behind or something, but <laughs> like it hasn't happened, but it, I, the only crazy thing I saw one night and I, I hadn't, I didn't, I wasn't drinking. Um, I was by myself. I was tired, but I always, I saw this pole in the fermentation hall, like just wiggling. And I'm like, is there's there's nothing going through it and i was just like staring at it it was long enough for it like keep going and i showed it to Corey the next day he's like you're tripping (laughs) yeah there's no there's no way that thing was moving there wasn't an earthquake and i'm like is that gary like shaking the pole but i i swear there's like there's something there and more people if you ever come and talk to some of the staff they'll have some more stories for you too it's pretty cool i believe it I believe in that stuff though. I believe in that. And I think I like, there's something there. I like the idea that Gary is kind of roaming, roaming this place that he created, right? Right. Well, I wish he would like whisper in my ear when he likes <laughs> one of my blends. I'd be like, all right, Gary, like that was a tiebreaker. You, you, you we're doing it. That's that one's you. That one's you. I love that. Um, we're going to wrap up a little bit, but you said something earlier and I wanted to ask you when you're making wine and you're tasting something with your team, and you're like, this is it, guys. This is this is going to be the wine, you know, this year, whatever. But a different wine sells out because the customers love that one more than the one that you love. Does that happen? Yeah. 
It does. I mean, we've we've definitely made our selections leaner. Like we've scaled down uh-huh. the quantity of wine we make, so things sell out fast. So it's good in that regard. I think sometimes when I I see like critics give a wine that I think is not as good a higher score, it's like oh, huh, interesting. Like I didn't see that one coming. Um, <laughs> like that that wine wasn't as good. I don't think, but maybe, maybe it was like, (laughs) you know, that, that gives you pause. Yeah. But I think more often than not, they always level each other out. Like people gravitate towards one wine and then another group of people gravitate towards another. And, you know, our job, there's this, there's this thing that happens when you blend wines and I'm looking for this like persistent line that just is like hyper long Uh and the only other thing i look at when we're blending our different blocks of fruit to make our single vineyard designates is like if it's if it's a pricier wine i want to make sure that the nose is in a gimme nose that it's inviting but you got to really dig into it to like enjoy it whereas like lower price wines as soon as they put their nose in the glass i wanted to like jump out and like smack them you know Wop wop, drink yeah. me, buy me. Yeah. So uh, those are those those are probably my two biggest focuses when blending. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, it's um, archery summit is strictly Pinot Noir. Yeah, we're mostly Pinot. We started making Chardonnay in 2017, and um, I love making Chardonnay, and I think the Willamette can grow some wonderful fruit. So we're slowly emerging as a Chardonnay producer. But to put it into perspective. We're about 9,000 to 10,000 cases of Pinot Noir, and we'll do around 1,000 of Chardonnay. Okay. And then we also make a Pinot Gris called Vierton Pinot Gris, um, and that one is anywhere from uh, 2,000 to 4,000 cases a year. Okay. But that's like screw cap, racy, food-driven, just easy-peasy uh, wine. Fun. But we're, we're definitely predominantly Pinot. Um, it was last year, I believe I was doing a story over at Durant and, um, Mr. Durant was taking me around kind of the property, showing me the grove, the olive trees, and he was pointing out all of his neighbors, which Archery Summit is a neighbor, Domain Serene is a neighbor, all the properties, right? Cause they kind of butt up against each other. And I just looked at him and I was like, man, you've got some pretty sweet neighbors over here. That's a, that's a awesome little nook. Right. Totally. It's and crazy. there's, there's something for everyone. Yeah. Like such, you know, different wine styles, but they all have their place, you know, and it's cool to see, you know, that side of the Dundee Hills kind of made into different expressions. Right. Right. You know, yeah, they're def- they're all worth trying. I totally agree. And I've been visiting the Willamette more in the last probably six months than I have my entire life, just doing work and, and other projects up there. And I hate to admit it, but it really is everything that it's cracked up to be. It is just, it's magical to me. I love Southern Oregon. Don't, no one hate on me, but the Willamette Valley is just, I'm sorry. It's just magic. It it really is. It never gets old. I drive from Eola at like 450 feet to Dundee to about 450 feet. And I drive through ag land. And I mean, every day I'm like, people would love to see this. Like it's just, there's so much beauty and color and you know, it, it changes so drastically with the seasons too. It's yeah. uh, a lovely, lovely place to, it's, it's easy on the eyes, I it guess. Is. It is easy on the eyes. And even just learning about the Van Duzer, the corridor and how the winds come through and it just, it's again, it's magic. And I know that's mother nature and I know that that's how it's been for years. And that's why things grow well there. I get it, but it's just, right. it's just magical. It's like my Disney. It really is. Life. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I adore it. And you know, I, I think agriculture has always been a big thing in the Willamette, but yep. you know, when I came in 2008, wine and vineyards were still not the largest agricultural commodity in terms of like what the state roasts, like it used to be grass seed, hazelnuts, um, uh, like pine trees, like uh, Christmas trees. And now the Willamette is like a multi-billion dollar industry. And we're actually, we're recognized by the EU now 
as a viticultural entity. The only other place that the EU, EU is recognized um, in the new world in the States is Napa. So Boom. I think it's like, whoa, yeah, we've got some just really great organizations like the Willamette Valley Wineries Association that is very good at rallying talent and educating people uh-huh. to, so that we're all like a little bit smarter and can move a little bit further together and, um, you know, getting the right people out into our tasting rooms and yeah. the right feet on the ground. So, yeah, and, and we love people like you spread the good word for, for us. You know, we, we couldn't, we couldn't do this without people like you that are excited about what we're doing. I'm working on it. I love wine and I have a big mouth. So <laughs> I'm working on it. Like, Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> before we get to the final three, I've noticed behind you, is that like a, a pear ladder, an orchard ladder? Yeah. It's a, it's a fruit ladder. Fruit so ladder. we have, we have uh, one upstairs that we like, decorated you know like pendleton blanket and some hanging some hanging plants but i've got two of these that i want to make like a like a bookshelf with so yeah and just like have all the books along the side on that wall there i'm actually i'm in my basement right now um yeah like kind of like confessions from ian's basement is what we're going to call this episode I love it. Okay, sir. Um, I think I sent you the final three questions. Oh yeah, okay, I looked at perfect. That. Good. I just like to kind of th- these are the only questions I'll ever prep guests on. Um, so let's get to the final three. Best advice you've ever been given. I would say, I'm going to go back to what I said before. Do whatever you do well, because you never know who you work with in the future. Just rock anything you do. And I, I especially tell this to people that don't know what they want to do. Like, oh, you you wanted to make wine when you were young. I wish I knew what I want to do. It's like, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Just like take something and like study it and figure out who does it the best and ask them questions and hold them close. And then, you know, if something better comes along, take it. I like it. That's, yeah, that's mine. Do what you do. Do it well. Yeah. Um, what's your happy place? Um, home, coming home and like, just, you know, it, it, like the, the poopy diapers and, you know, the arguing with with the kids amongst themselves and, you know, like the, why doesn't he eat his dinner and the hugs and kisses and, you know, just like the little snuggles, you know, that it's, it's definitely my happy place is, you know, my family here. I, I love them. And you just had, you and your wife just had your third. Yeah, a little baby Jude. So he's three months old and, uh, you know, he's being kinder to us nightly. Nice. Um, I like, I, I think if you saw me <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I would have larger bags under my eyes. <laughs> but I'm like, I feel like I'm like waking up and I'm being like, hey, honey, well, do you feel that? She's like, what? I'm like, I feel normal. Like I slept. It feels so good. <laughs> Sleep deprivation is a thing. Wow. It'll make you crazy. I'm, oh, it, it, it is. She's still in the thick of it a little bit because she's got to like take care of his every, every single need. Right. But, you know, um, we're, I think we're almost out of the weeds. Fantastic. Not con- yep. yeah. um, okay. In all things food and drink, what do you crave? Oh, this one was so tough. I'm split. I'm split between like a good shawarma, lamb shawarma. Okay. You know, like simple ingredients, like fresh, fresh, like falafel or whatever that is, the pita bread. Yes. Um, really like nice, nice little hot sauce, good or, or like good, like sort of like yogurt sauce, uh-huh. hummus, grape leaves, and a red stripe. Like that's like my happy place. Wow. And then the other happy place is like, a beautiful piece of sushi, just like a perfectly like tasting piece of fish Uh with a glass of champagne, you know, like I think those are kind of like equal in my life and where I spent most of my college, um, like money, like so all the, all the student loans I got went to sushi and uh, shawarmas that I had to pay off for years. (laughs) 
eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just in you. It's nostalgic. <laughs> it's in you. I love it. So good. Um, Ian Birch, winemaker at Archery Summit, you have been so much fun. Again, I knew you were going to be a hoot in this interview, but I had no idea I was going to get all these confessions. Oh man. Well, we'll have to do it again. Yeah. And I'm very, I feel very honored that you had me on and, you know, I've been really enjoying getting to know you the last few years. Like yeah. you're, you're such a kind person to be around. And I, I like the questions you ask and you always seem to really like have all of your stuff together. It's very enjoyable to talk with you. Oh, ditto, my friend. It's always, um, you know, there's, um, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Andre DeShields. He's a um, Broadway actor. He has three cardinal rules of, of life, like three rules. One of them is surround yourself with people who light up when they see you coming. And that's great. You are in that category for me. Just like, oh. you know, when you see someone and you're just like, hey, hey. that's you. Yes. So thank you. Yes. You just made my day. I'm like, my Monday is off to an awesome start. Okay. Well, like, go, yeah. It, go, Go take care of those sick kids. <laughs> right. Here we go. <laughs> um, it's been really nice chatting. Once again, Ian Birch, um, thank you so much. And if my listeners, if you're ever up in the Willamette Valley, stop by Archery Summit and take in all of the good things that it has to offer. Thanks, Ian. Wonderful. Thank you. You've been listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma with me, Trish Glose. You can watch this podcast and subscribe on my YouTube channel. Just search Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma. You can also listen and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts.